Hey up and welcome to the Strategy Sessions. My name is Andy Jarvis. I'm here today to introduce episode 18, an interview with Kyle Lacey, the Chief Marketing Officer of a company called Lessonly, based over in the US of A. Um, we talk about all sorts of stuff, about measuring brand campaigns. We talk about getting the right people. We even have a little bit of a segue into history um, and bring it back, talking about the history of content marketing. I uh, really think you'll enjoy today's episode, so please do dive in. Top tips are back, T-O-P-T-I-P. -P. Um, it's inserted into the middle of the episode today so special one from me so you'll have to have a listen to that any thoughts on the episode any thoughts on the show please do get in touch i'm at andy jarvis a-n-d-i-j-a-r-b-i-s you'll find me on twitter and linkedin mainly you can also get me on instagram at eximo marketing so let's get on with the interview with kyle Hey up and welcome to the strategy sessions. Today I am joined by Kyle Lacey, who's the Chief Marketing Officer at Lessonly. Kyle, how are you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Uh, look, thank you for joining us today. It's great to um, to cross borders, cross continents, and to hear what people from different parts of the world have to say and think about marketing, especially, I've got to say, in America, where, look, here in Britain and Ireland, we tend to look at what's happening in the States from a marketing lens and go, okay, they feel like they're a little bit in front of us. So it's good to tap into people who are living right at the forefront of what's going on. So welcome to the show. Happy to be here. Thank you. Right. Let's tell us, tell the listeners about Lessonly. What, what is it? How do you describe it? What's the product? So Lessonly is enablement and training software, mainly focused on sales and customer service teams. So if you want to decrease onboarding, if you want your reps to practice, if you want ticket resolution, um, you know, it's mostly focused on uh, frontline teams, customer facing teams. Okay. And what type of customers are in the sweet spot or in the, the, the bullseye customer for you? Um, bullseye customers are usually software companies that have raised money. So if you think about, you know, you've, you've raised 20 million, you need to hire 50 AEs or you need to hire a product team or you got to, you know, you need some type of software to help you with onboarding and persona and mess like the, the education of the rep. And then you need, you need help practicing, you know, if you practice email pitches or phone calls or uh, video or whatever. Um, so it's software. And then on the, on the larger side of the business, it could be retail sales. It could be large call centers. So we, we're not, we're kind of industry agnostic. It's mostly the team uh, is mm -hmm. where we're focused. So with that um, focus on team and solving problems for your clients, you're sat in, in the chief marketing officer chair. There's a lot of different things you can focus on. You've got so much competing pressures on, on where you spend your marketing dollars. What sort of processes do you go through to decide, look, these are the things we're focusing on this quarter or this year or, or, or whatever the planning cycle is? So we, so we try to, this is the first year where we have, we have set up a six month planning cycle. We usually were quarter to quarter. And the way that we focus on it from a budget perspective is 75% of spend headcount and, and, and uh, program spend goes towards demand gen because marketing, the marketing team at Lessonly owns a revenue number, mm -hmm. uh, direct source revenue. And then 25% of it goes to brand building, culture building, community building. So the key there, which is very important and something that I preach quite constantly is that that 25% shouldn't be measured. You should not sit with the team and say, this brand campaign, you need to get X. Because what happens with creatives, in my opinion, is that uh, when they have a revenue number or a traffic number or whatever, it stunts their creativity. And uh, great ideas are usually irrational and not based off of data. There's a great book by uh, Rory Sutherland, who's the chairman of Ogilvy. Uh, he has a book called Alchemy that's all about irrational thinking. And it, I have built a lot of how we do our planning around that book because I believe that uh, I want my team to have fun while also driving revenue, but you can only have fun if you drive revenue, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Cause you can't just have a bunch of brand campaigns that don't do anything. Right. Yeah. So that, yeah, you, you, the, the demand generation kind of buys you the ticket to the game and the, the, yeah. the have fun game for brand marketing. Okay. It's interesting that you're saying about it, not measured by revenue, but do you measure it by 
any other softer factors, whether that's just um, search volumes, traffic to the site, sentiment analysis, anything like that? We don't. No. We don't. And there, there's probably, there's, there is always, you and I both know there's always work to be done in what we do, right? Like it's high growth venture back SaaS. Uh, it's a, it's usually, none of us know what we're doing, right? So, but what, what I do know is that uh, my team can, can pull, pull um, great experiences off. And my success is really when we get feedback from prospects or customers. I don't, it's not really an MPS score. It's when somebody shares something. It's when we get a feedback from an account manager on how delighted, you know, we want to, we, I took this from exact target, which is in my past life, but surprise and delight prospects and customers. And you can't do that if you're 100% focused on revenue generation, in my opinion. So giving the team the ability to do that stuff, we've done board games, golden llamas, all of our, all of our virtual events are not measured. It's like, the experience is all that matters because frankly, in a features war, which we're all in, that's all that really matters in the long run. It's really interesting. because I think my view of uh, SaaS marketing is that it, it does become a dog eat dog world of bottom of the funnel conversion activity. Uh, you know, the, everyone's measured on either monthly or annually recurring revenue mm. or um, ARPU and you, you kind of, you have a real target and a real, and if you miss those numbers for a consistent number of weeks, you tend to have somebody knocking on your door going, thanks mate. See you later. Yeah. So, you know, it to, seems like a really brave decision to carve out a, a significant chunk of your budget, a quarter of your budget and go like, we're not going to measure this. This is big brand building activity. That's a, a brave move. Yeah. I mean, but if we didn't hit, if we didn't hit our revenue numbers, which we do, you know, that, you know, I'm not sure that I'd be given that latitude from the board, right? But we, because I was blessed with a team that is just the most creative people I've ever worked with, honestly, they, they deliver things that, that we, that rival uh, consumer marketing, in my opinion. And mm -hmm. um, if you can get a team to do that, and you're seeing, I think you're seeing this with some of the e-commerce brands, like Fast and Gorgeous and some of these other uh, Shopify, you know, in the Shopify ecosystem where they're starting to look more like consumer marketing because you and I were talking earlier, what, what would, how do you define B2B? Uh, yeah. B2B boring to boring marketing. <laughs> that I, I 100%. And I don't, I don't understand why, like why, why do we have to be that way? Right. Like, and Dave Gerhardt's a great example of that at Privy. Like he also yeah. talks about that Wistia great example of they believe they need to be a media company, not a software company, right? So yeah. I, I feel like there's a lot of us pushing, pushing people towards, you know, marketers towards the way we should do things, in my opinion. But uh, experience, in the long run, experience is, is all that matters. I don't care if you're buying a coffee pot or a piece of, of annual software. Yeah. I think right. Oh, let's just hold the interview there. We're only a few minutes in, but it is time for a T-O-P-T-I-P. T-O-P-T-I-P. Look, B2B marketing, um, as I said just then, boring to boring. I am sick to death of such boring marketing being pushed at us from B2B. You've got great things to talk about. Why are you just boring everybody with features? We heard the other week on one of the shows from Chris at Lightyear that, look, features become important when you're selling B2B, and they do. But how do you get away from that? So my top tip is to how B2B marketers can stop being boring to boring. First thing, talk to your customers. When you talk to your customers, they often use emotive language like, this is killing me. I love this. That's amazing. Find those bits of emotive language that they use and work out what they're talking about and where their overlap is with, with all the different customers you talk to. Secondly, when you use that, take that back and start talking to your customers and solving the problems that they're talking about with that emotive language. Nobody's ever used an emotive language for 19 buttons instead of 15. It's the problems that they're solving. So talk to your customers, get them on the phone, go meet them. COVID times, maybe you can't get them on a Zoom call, whatever. Find out what you, where they use emotive language and try and solve those problems in your marketing. That will stop you being boring to boring and it will help connect you to your customers. Right, that's enough of me. Back to, well, me talking to Kyle. I think the thing I see is that um, 
in, in a lot of industries, not all industries really, there's a lot of copying of competitors going on. So why or how B2B became boring to boring or just focused on feature, 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 I'm, I'm not sure, but it becomes the, the way that people look at it. They're looking and they go, oh, well, they're doing it that way. They're a big company. It must be the right way. We'll take that. Or when they apply, um, when they're recruiting for business, recruiting for staff, sorry, they put in the app, job application, must have experience in the SaaS industry or in the construction industry. So all you do is you bring people who've done something one way in one place into a business and you kind of end up with a filter bubble of ideas. So nobody yeah. thinks differently until you bring a consumer marketer into a SaaS company and they go, why do you do this? Yeah. You, don't, you don't bring that outside thought in, which I suppose takes us nicely to recruitment. You, you spoke lovingly about your team there. What do you look for in people? I mean, we, we, we rely pretty heavily on predictive index, which is a personality profile. I mean, I'm butchering what it actually is, but you know, <laughs> gauging, gauging what people are good at and how they approach work and how they approach life, right? We rely heavily on that in our interviewing process because um, we, have, we, we are pretty, um, like we'll hire... The best marketer that I've hired was at a minute, like he wasn't even a marketer. He, he was at a ministry in Illinois and we hired him because he knocked his presentation out of the park. So there's two things that we do. I'm going to be very prescriptive here. There's two things we do. Number one is we have predictive index at the beginning and we have some type of form fill or whatever. You're like, Hey, tell us what we should do with the homepage. And then we have a presentation at the end of the interview cycle on your first 90 days. And what that shows we have made, we have, we have flipped uh, hiring decisions twice because somebody was better at a presentation. Like it was just more creative. And yeah. so I think that allows us to, to keep bringing people in. What I do see changing, which is interesting in, in you know, uh, the community and listeners, I love opinions here, is as you grow and hit different revenue bands, there is more pressure to hire people that have experienced that growth of revenue band. Mm -hmm. And I'm having a hard time um, navigating that as a leader uh, because I will always kind of fall back on this idea that um, uh, our CEO, Max Yoder, said it best, hire over potential, not credential. And I, I don't know if he made that up or he heard that somewhere, but, <laughs> but that just stuck with me ever since he said it to me. Um, and that's the most important part. But you feel that pressure as revenue grows and the targets maybe get steeper or the company gets bigger yeah. to then start picking up players who've worked at the big B2B or the big SaaS companies before go, okay, can we take that person from HubSpot because they've got that on their CV? So or, that's or a pressure that you feel. Yeah, who, who's experienced that growth stage that we're in? Not necessarily, yeah. I would not pluck them from Salesforce or HubSpot right now, right? But um, it's that growth stage, like, the question is, can you find leaders that, that, and, and, and even uh, individual contributors that are repeatable, much like our product market fit, right? Is yeah. that possible? Does it exist? I've seen it a couple of times, of course, but, um, and, and, you know, the, the team, when I joined at Lessonly, we were 40 something people and now we're, we're 215 and, and the company changes as you do that, as you yeah. hire and grow. And you've got to break all your processes, haven't you? When a company grows, Every time, I mean, roughly every time it doubles in size, but there's lots of different ways of looking at that. Everything that worked for you then, you have to break and start again. The number of people, how many are in the marketing team now? Um, we will end January with, I think, close to 40, but that's because um, uh, outbound. So the BDRs and SDRs report into marketing. Gotcha. So you, you've got more people in marketing by the end of the month than the company had when you joined. So yeah. all those processes, <laughs> yeah. you know, you, you know, your, your team meeting was probably just you and three faces looking back at you at the time. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, now it's like, okay, so everything from not just marketing, but finance and all the processes have to break oh, yeah. and, and regrow. And that's, that's part of the fun of the job though, right? Isn't it? You're going through those stages and having to find new gears. Yeah. It, but I, I think my, yeah, what well, 100%, that's why I love it. That's why I love, I will never get out of software. I love it. And because of the speed that you move, but I would, the, the most important part is playbooks and templates and having some type of foundation and then breaking them, like you said. And, and that's what I look for. Like I, I will hire somebody with no experience as long as they are a fast learner and proactive because they will pick up playbooks and then they'll look at it 
like what Ben Battaglia did when we hired him. And now he's a VP of marketing at another company here in Indy. Um, he will, he breaks all of them because he doesn't have any head trash, but he's smart enough to understand what is valuable in each playbook. Right. And if, for example, if I were to ever become a CRO and run a sales team, I think it's complete crap that people say you have to have sold or be an AE to be a CRO, right? Just hire a great VP that's great at sales and you help them break playbooks because you have to, there's, there, there's no way around it. So I think it's the playbook and the foundation of how you build it and the community of people around you. Uh, that will help you learn and help you grow. That's even more important. Yeah. It, like, it goes back to the point I was making, I suppose. If you just keep employing people with the same background yeah. and the same thought yeah. process, you just end up with no diversity of thought. And that, that's yeah. not necessarily about gender or background or the school they went to, but that, you know, those first 10, 15 years of the career, they're taught the same thing, they think the same way, and you bring them in, you go, why do we keep doing the same thing? I wonder why. <laughs> well, it's yeah, just... it's, and it's, it's, it, it blows me away that, and I worked, I worked at a VC firm. So I, so I feel like I can say this. It blows me away that we keep pushing on hiring and revenue bands when every business is different. Like it, yeah. it, every single business is different. The, the people that you hire, the products. And so we need to be a little bit, you know, better at how we hire talent and not just, did you experience X amount of growth over X amount of time? No, no, good point. Very good point. And so in terms of, we'll stay on sort of hiring and people and, and um, we'll mention coronavirus because, well, you know, it's January, we're deep in it still and we can't, we can't not mention it. Um, your whereabouts are you based uh, geographically? Which, you know, where's the office? And how has it affected you now? Have you got remote teams? Are you looking at hiring people all around the world? What, what's, the, what's the present and what's the future? Yeah, I mean, you, you talk about uh, process change and breaking playbooks is when we all went remote in March. Like we, so we have, um, at the time we had 180 people that all were most, most of them were here in Indy. So 160 of us were going in the office every day. And then when we all went remote, um, we had, we had a pretty good idea of how to re run remote meetings and stuff. It took a month or so for us to really figure it out. But what has happened is that um, as we've opened up hiring again, we, we are hiring from all over, mostly in the, U yeah, actually not all over, in the U.S. And uh, number one, you, you, have, you have a, um, a greater community or greater network to choose from to hire, which is great. The downside is that it is ungodly competitive right now because everybody is hiring remote, <laughs> right? So the talent team, which I'm gonna give them a ton of credit, they had to completely redo the way we thought about hiring because most of our hires were in Indy, right? Indianapolis, Indiana. So um, it's, cha it's changed the way we've built our company. It's, it's starting to shift culture in a positive way. You're bringing on different uh, modes of thought because you're hiring all over the United States. Um, and it gives you a bigger pool of people. It's just how it so happens that that big pool of people also has a big pool of people trying to hire them, right? <laughs> Everybody chasing the talent and you need talent to grow as an organization, yeah. don't you? That's, it's, it's essential to it. On location as well, you know, you, you mentioned that you're looking at uh, sometimes VC backed firms and things like that, that are growing as great clients for you. What's the view of being based in Indianapolis compared to maybe being in, San Francisco or, or New York or, or somewhere that maybe has a little bit might, might be seen more traditionally as a place where you'd find those companies. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, our founders are all based here and uh, we, it, the cost of living here is, doesn't even come close. So the talents here, because exact target was here, who was bought by Salesforce and there's a lot of software talent here. Salesforce is second largest offices in Indianapolis surprisingly, because of that marketing cloud purchase. Um, so it makes sense to stay here. And now we've, we, we have, we have the, we have uh, all the other people outside of Indiana to hire as well. So we've got a great network of people here, cost of living's cheap and it's cheap to have office space. So it just makes sense. It's, it's also the reason why people are hitting Nashville and Atlanta 
Austin, Austin, I think is getting too expensive now, but mm-hmm. why, why those other cities are growing Columbus, Ohio as well. Yeah. Um, Atlanta is where MailChimp are based, isn't it? That's their, their, their HQ. Yeah, I think so. I think they're, yeah. yeah. So, and, and what about I mean, time zones? I'm in the UK. We don't have, a, everyone's on the same time zone. Dealing, when I try to organize interviews with people like you or dealing with people across Europe, I'm working with a, um, a university in Finland at the minute. Time zones just melt my mind because we never really have to use them. Is it just part of the everyday challenges of life for you guys in the States where you, you span a number of time zones anyway? Or has, it, has that even thrown more um, problems into the mix? It hasn't thrown problems. We, we actually, most are either Central or Eastern. We just, on my team, we just hired somebody in Washington state. So she's three hours behind. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> it hasn't been difficult. It, we've just shifted standups and meetings forward. So, so she's not jumping on a call at 6 a.m. Yeah. And does that, there's a sort of three hours difference, obviously, to, to West Coast, but only five hours to London or, or Ireland where I am. So are you now, is that kind of the next step in the plan, looking at global talent or certainly talent within a certain time zone reach? I think it really depends on the international strategy to begin with. Right now we're focused on North America. So, um, you know, when the time, we do have customers all over the world, but the majority of them are in the in United States, Canada. As, as we continue to grow and scale, you, you know, as well as I do that, you, you have to expand internationally eventually, right? Mm-hmm. So when that time comes, that is when we will start really building out that that team. Um, but for right now, it's pretty much North America. Yeah. Okay. No, no, that's good. That's good. Well, look, let, let's go back a step as well. So before you were at Lessonly, um, you worked at a business that's been acquired. Uh, so give us a little bit of the, just the sort of details of the acquisition, not into what happened and why, but just what, what's the headlines of that acquisition? Well, I... I uh, so just to be clear, um, there were, I joined exact target in 2012. We were email marketing software. It was, it was the market leader. When I joined, I'm pretty sure we hired 500 people the year I joined. So me being involved in the acquisition is a nice way to say, I worked at a company of 2000 people that was acquired (laughs) (laughs) just to be clear, just to be clear to the audience here. However, Um, you know, we, we experienced, you know, what the year I joined, we bought two companies, we bought Pardot and I go digital. We went, we went public and then we were bought all in a span of, of, um, three years, two and a half years. And, um, I, I think that the, the experience as an employee, because it was so valuable, I mean, we, at the time we were Salesforce's largest acquisition. And then this mm-hmm. was 2015, I think uh, 2.6 billion dollars, and uh, it was exciting because we we now had a much larger group of people to work with, right? Like we were part of the Salesforce ecosystem, and then you learn uh, how people deal with acquisitions, and you know, like Salesforce, we spent we spent a year as the Salesforce Exact Target Marketing Cloud because exact target had such a strong brand. Um, on the flip side, I've heard that Oracle completely, it doesn't matter who you are. They will get, you know, you turn Oracle the day you're bought. Right. So for, for Salesforce, it was, um, it was cool because we were now part of this bigger entity. What, uh, was interesting was a lot of us had to report to VPs in San Francisco. So you were actually pretty removed from, uh, who you were reporting to because everybody was still trying to figure out how to integrate uh, the mm-hmm. company. So it was a great experience, mainly just because you got to witness firsthand how large software companies make acquisitions. And uh, you got to see, I mean, sale, everybody has their opinion about Salesforce. There's one thing that I will always argue. They are the best brand marketing. Mark Benioff is freaking brilliant at it and he always will be and i learned a ton just watching him just watching how they went about messaging and goal setting and they're they they have a system called v2 mom that's basically a waterfall um waterfall goal orientation for the entire team and so 
me as a senior director of global content marketing could track my objectives all the way up to Mark Benioff. And, you know, wow. a company of 40,000 people, stuff. that's, that's powerful. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it, it was awesome. It was awesome. And then I just learned pretty quickly that I was not built for a 40,000 person org where, uh, you know, there were, there were a thousand vice presidents. Yeah. And, and so two, two things, I want to come back to that point. Um, I just want to tell you about, uh, marketing professor, a guy called Mark Ritson, who uh, hopefully will be on the show at some point, but keep my fingers crossed for that. He was asked recently what one of his favorite ads of all time is. And he, he said, usually, you know, you, you, you people just talk about Apple's ad and they talk about VW ads and various yeah. things. So he said, I wanted to give something different. And he thought about it for a moment and he came up with Salesforce's uh, graph, which is the just the, the chart which shows you who how much bigger yeah. it is than everyone else. Yep. And he's like, just think about this for a moment. He said, it's the ugliest ad you will ever see. And it's the most effective ad. You look at yep. that and you go, why would I go anywhere else? <laughs> it just tells you everything you need to yeah. know about it. Um, now there'll be, a, I'll put a link to that in the show notes so that you can see it. And, um, yeah, and they, Kyle, and I'll, pay, I'll mail it across to you. They pay, they paste it right on the front of like the wall street journal, like right on the very front page. <laughs> it's yeah. just like, and it, and it's just so much bigger than everyone. And like everyone else in it and co competitors are named as well. And yeah. there's some big names in there and they just wipe it. the floor with them. Right. You know, wow, I love this it. Is great. So no, I've never big, seen I'm a big before. fan of, I'm a big fan of Salesforce as a company. Yeah. Good. So, so talk to me about your experiences there. Cause I, I know uh, fit is a really important part when uh, for employees, not just product market fit and all that, but fit for employees is really important. And I know I've found I've struggled sometimes when I've been in the wrong culture or in the wrong size of organization. So what were your experiences then when you went into a, because you, you were exec target were a big company anyway, but you then went into a company that was 40,000 people. Did it just feel wrong for you? I, I don't. Uh, yeah, but I would, I felt wrong, but we got to keep in mind that uh, exact target was my first job in software. I, had I had worked in I had worked at an agency and then started an agency and owned one before that, so I didn't real I didn't really know <laughs> what I wanted right. So what I did know was that I wasn't um, at the time, you know, decision by committee, which you have to do in a company that big. Uh, I was not fond of and I didn't really like, um, and also the fact that my. Uh, the, the guy I was reporting to um, was in San Francisco and was kind of uh, left me alone, was a no touch ma manager, which I actually liked for the most part. But I, but at the time I was kind of, um, I was craving like more mentorship uh, and because I wanted to learn. And then what I, and then I just, I, I discovered pretty quickly that what I loved was the fast paced growth, which, which we were still having at exact target. Um, and that's why, and then that's how I, I came across the VC opportunity with open view and then at lessonly. Gotcha. Okay. So, and, and it feels much more at home now in, in that fast growth area and, you know, the different challenges that you face with that. Yeah. And that's, and, and because as what I love is breaking things and, tr and failing just, just constantly testing and trying to figure out what works and and change and in large organizations you don't need to right because the model's there it's built mm -hmm. like that salesforce is a freaking machine like you don't it it is just unbelievable so you know for me i just learned that that, that was not that was not what really drove me yeah so, so let's keep going back. The agency that you um you built and the role at exact target were content marketing roles is that right yeah, it was, it was a, we had a, um, it was interesting because it was the first r real content marketing team that I knew of at the time. It was, it, we were, it was basically a thought leadership team. So we had four people and all we did was speak at conferences. So instead of having a product person, you'd send one of us and we would talk what the, the, what was different was they were doing primary research. So if, uh, if an uh, example is if exact target, uh, was going into Germany, they would go do consumer research in Germany, like 
57% of German consumers bought a second uh, purchase, uh, purchase twice because of an email. And they would produce that research and then launch it into in country for, for press. And we were doing that in 2012. Right. And now everybody does it. Right. And, and so that, that was the content that we were producing and we had, we were producing primary research by the time I left, we were producing primary research in uh, six countries and four different languages because it's what was working. And, and the reports are still there, like the sale, the, the state of the sales cloud and state of the marketing cloud, all those originated out of exact target. Brilliant stuff. And, and that probably opens up a question about um, content and versus content marketing. You've got a an industry now where people, marketing consultants like me are forever on stage writing blogs saying, create more content, create more content, create more content. Um, with very little thought often about how you distribute that content or who it's for or what audience it yeah. goes to. And there is so much content now that even standing out can be quite difficult too. So what do you see as that demarcation between just creating content and content marketing? And, and what are the maybe a couple of key lessons people could take away to say, right, how do we do this really, really well? I think I think it depends on your channel mix and what your go to market strategy is, because for us, organic is a huge driver. We produce a lot of content because organic search, we we need to maintain organic search. Right. And that's a whole nother. We could talk an hour about that, but. Um, and then from a from just the content production standpoint, it's again, I'm going to go back to the surprise and delight, mm -hmm. like produce content that people want to read in a way that people want to read it. And I, and I will be the first to say that I don't think I've ever been um, to a point where I feel like it's perfect. Right. It, I think the closest we've gotten is, is using drift on our site where you can read the, like, we don't gate anything mm -hmm. pretty much. The only thing that's gated is our demo. So you can read everything. And if you want to chat with us, you can chat with us. Or if you want to chat with Ali Lama, you can chat with Ali Lama. Um, so, so content for us is, is mainly um, production because of the organic search component. And then we have one or two major pieces that would be more um, mid or bottom of the funnel uh, in order to help support sales. So, mm -hmm. uh you know, for, for people to be able to do what we were doing at exact target. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure this is not headcount. My, my pro program budget just for the research was a million dollars. Wow. That didn't, I had a team of 12 in Indy for exact target. Like they, we went hardcore because, mm -hmm. and we had, you know, we had the opportunity to do it. So it really depends on the channel mix, depends on the strategy, depends on a lot of things. Yeah. And I suppose lessons change over time, don't they? Between you know some of the things that were working in in 2012, if you just rinsed and repeated them, might not work now. But what were the what are the sort of process steps that you take to to try and ensure that you get more hits than misses? I know testing and learning is important, but you obviously want to try and get your win loss ratio up. So what are the process things that you have to help you do that? It's 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 really hard for us to do it a lessonly, mainly because we look at content as a part of the overall experience, not a demand driver, right? So, you know, for for us, it's it's production, but it's also um, how are we including customers? How are we including our community? How are we making content that people want to read? So, I wouldn't say we have a system where we are constantly evolving what we're doing, other than having um, we do a lot of CRO testing on the site, but for creativity, you know, we're just constantly pushing each other to do things that are different. Like, right. Mm -hmm. Instead of doing a PDF, why don't we throw the content into our product and people can go take a lesson on it. Right. So, you know, it's, it's hard because we don't really retro content because we don't drive demand via content that will change as, uh, we're, we, we have a really good relationship with Forrester. And mm -hmm. as we start doing more with them, I think, I think that changes, but that's also because we're, we move up market and we sell yeah. the large companies. And I think that's a completely different content strategy than, than somebody selling asset to SMB. Yeah, no, 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 make, makes perfect sense. You, you touched earlier on about uh, the Llama as part of your strategy. And I want to talk about um, 
adding personality. We've talked earlier about boring to boring marketing. And if yeah. you go to the Lessonly site, uh, a llama pops up to greet you and you can have uh, live interaction with the llama. Where does that come from? Is there any pushback from people going, you know, we're a serious uh, product. Why have we got a llama? What are those discussions that you have internally and, and how did it come about? Well, uh, the llama predates me. I think the story is that somebody's significant other drew a llama on. We were in a we were in an old school building before we moved to our new office, and there were chalkboards everywhere. They drew a llama on a chalkboard, and for some reason, it kept popping up and it never went away. The cleaning crew never erased it, and it was just this llama. And eventually, uh, Mitch Kazi, who was the third employee, he was the director of marketing at the time. He said, "Let's let's use the llama." as a mascot, because in, I think that was like 2013, 2014, where, where there was this huge uh, trend to just have mascots as software companies. And then they came up with Ollie. And when I, when I came, I just, the opportunity, because it was tasteful and it fit our culture to, to maximize Ollie Llama and to use, to use Ollie to differentiate us was just too big. So we just, we doubled down on Ollie and we never, we haven't come across um, anyone customer or employee or prospect who has been turned off by it because I think it's tasteful. I think it's done in a way that's not corny and there's a fine balance. You and I both know where you can have a corny as hell mascot and it will screw you up in the future. But I just, I think a lot of it just has to do with how we, how we evolve Ollie. Like we actually have a real life Ollie on a farm in New Jersey that we sponsor and gets on zoom calls and has a lessonly like blanket that it wears. And uh, it's pretty fun. Really? So it, it's uh, even though I think what you're saying is even though the, the, the mascot was there when you started, the reason it stays is because the culture and the, the ethos of the organization it matches. If it didn't, you could park the llama and, and leave Ali alone. Yeah, but. we. I, yeah, it, it doubled down because, and this is uh, this is how kind of taking culture and building it into marketing because I think culture also can help sell something. We give a golden llama every quarter to an employee that um, best represents uh, our culture and values, mm -hmm. and uh, we decided to send golden llamas to customers and prospects to give to their employees. And I, I remember we found a, a manufacturer in Michigan that did these three inch llamas that I had to spray paint gold. So I've probably spray painted like 2,500 of these llamas. I'll, I'll <laughs> die. I'll die young because I inhaled all this spray paint, but um, we've sent, we've sent close to 5,000 of these out and it doesn't sell the product. And it's just like, here, here is an award to give to an employee that you feel is doing their great work. And because of the Golden Llama, because that direct mail campaign worked really well, we continue to do it. It just, Ollie continues to evolve. And the next phase, we, we launched an e-commerce brand in uh, December called Ollie Llama & Co. That has no affiliation with Lessonly. It's just a clothing brand. So, so it's, it's. <laughs> And that, that's an example of what we talked about earlier. Like no software company other than Fast, I think Fast is the example where they sent like 30,000 hoodies to people. No yeah, software hoodies, company yeah. should be doing an e-commerce site at all. And it, you know, we've, we, we've surpassed a thousand orders of just clothes right. with llamas on it. I mean, it's just... Uh what crazy. do you say to, to the, the, the strategists and the marketers and the people who are saying what you've done there, it, it's a great, it's lovely, it's fun, but you're losing focus. You're in a difficult market. You've got revenue targets to hit. You've got brand, you've got people have only got so much time. Why are you wasting your time doing that? As nice as it is, why are you wasting your time doing that? Well, we build it into our sales process. So ultimately it's not wasting time because we can give gift cards out to do prospects to go buy gear. And it's all, it's all about the experience, right? Like I am not going to send a prospect, another freaking custom Yeti or a t-shirt or a blanket. Like we don't need any more of that, but will I send them to a beautiful custom e-commerce site for them to order something in their size and the color that they want? 
Hell yeah, because none of my competitors are doing that. So mm -hmm. yes, it does. And I, creative people, people that you hire out of agencies, consumer marketers, you've got to, you've got to continue breaking the model to, for them to stick around. Like you churn creatives when you start, when you keep doing landing pages. <laughs> I'm very passionate about this particular topic, if you can't tell. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I just, um, yeah, if I see one more how to design the perfect landing page piece of content, I'm going <laughs> yeah. to scream. I just, someone sent me one this morning. I was like, oh, my good God, it's 2014 again. <laughs> uh, right. So, true. so uh, sticking with people, um, look, my, my mission statement is strategy uh, times people equals performance. So I, I talk as much about marketing and strategy stuff as I do about people, uh, which is why, why we still go. But what about the non-work non, non people family? Uh, you know, you've spent a lot of time working at home now, but that doesn't necessarily mean you get to spend more time with the family. How do you juggle a uh, commitment of two young kids, full-time job, lots of other stuff going on? Um, my wife's a saint, number one. Um, number two, I try as much as possible to, and I'm, I haven't been great about this over the past couple of months, but uh, unplug whenever I leave this room that I'm in. For those of you who are listening, I'm in a office in my house. Um, I try to unplug, you know, I try to leave my phone in the office as much as possible. Um, and just, just have, you know, if I have four hours with my kids, just trying to be present. And it's, it's been very difficult recently just because of everything that's going on in the world, uh, in the business and like in a quarter and all this stuff. But, um, I try to just, unplug i also don't and this is very tactical but i don't have push notifications so i you know i don't i am not getting pinged every time somebody tweets or sends me a linkedin dm or you know uh sends me an email and, and that's probably that's probably the best part of all this is just shut off your notifications and you're going to get some time to breathe um because you're being constantly bombarded do you, do you know, I am um, in the summer, just gone, I killed all my social media notifications. Um, text messages, yes, I leave them on. Nobody texts me. It's all WhatsApp. I tend to leave WhatsApp and email on, work email only. Everything else is shut down. So I must have gone, I must have cut my number of notifications per day by to about 20% just by yeah. killing all social media. And it's glorious, isn't it? It's brilliant. Yeah, you should do that anyway. And then you know, I usually, I try to take two weeks out of the year where I delete everything off my phone and just have text messages. So I'm, I'm completely unplugged for two weeks. Um, yeah. and, and you guys over the pond are way better at this than we are in America where you have like six month holidays, but that we, you know, <laughs> trying to unplug at least a little bit, uh, is important. Yeah, it, it, it completely baffles me how Americans can get through a whole year. You guys get like 10 days annual leave. Is that right? Or something like that? And that's well, generous. We, we, look, we work at trend, a trendy software company, so we have un, unlimited vacation. I, I, would, I would get, and you know, you don't, if you don't have the numbers or if you don't want to share them, that's fine. But do, do you track on the unlimited vacation? How long, what, what's the average number of days people take? So we, we don't track that. What we have done is uh, we actually mandate when people have to take time. Like uh, earlier, later and later last year, 2020, we had a campaign internally where it was take five by 12, five. And each manager had to manage their teams and, and the teammates had to pick five days they were taking off. And mm -hmm. the managers were held to saying each person has to take five days off. Yeah. So it, I don't, I, um, I'm not, uh, hopefully I'm not, um, uh, mis misrepresenting what we do on the talent side, but I don't think we're tracking it, but we are definitely it's front and center for us because yeah. we spend a lot of time and energy as a, as a team investing in mental health and, um, having conversations around that. We have a support network that helps them with, uh, helps the team it's with therapy sessions and you could go get counseling and all that stuff that we provide to the team. So mm -hmm. taking time off is definitely part of that. Brilliant. No, no, that's, that sounds great. Cause I think some of the companies in, I know in the UK who first started introducing unlimited holidays did track that. And what they realized was that people 
uh, because they didn't time. have the target, we were taking you know taking less less holiday. So it was a bit, but but they yeah. they recognised that and then put some structures in place where they they mandated certain leave and, and various bits. But um, yeah, it, it's interesting. We do seem to get more days off here than a standard employee would in the states. Let's put it that way. But uh, I think that, well, that's we, probably I a historical thing. Sorry, yeah, but... I remember an exact target where where we would we would build go to market campaigns around Australians' holidays because we knew that that they were going to be gone for like three months. So you were not going to do any campaigns to our APAC, our yep. APAC network during that time. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But I think that there's a historical element to that as well. And I think, you know, the rise of the, the unions and, and, and it goes back, I think there's cultural reasons to go with it sure. as well. Um, and even look, if you look at just the European Union, it tends to be, uh, I, I do find going on Twitter sometimes quite hilarious because if you, there's a whole raft of Americans who think that the European Union is essentially a sleeper communist state because of some <laughs> some of the policies that they come with, like worker protection and things like that. And it, you know, it's like, geez, you guys are commies, and they're like, you really don't know what communist means, do you? But uh, <laughs> it, there's a very different cultural approach in in Europe and the UK that, than in America. But it, well, if that's if that's the worst thing you found of what Americans are saying, then that's, that's <laughs> Oh, we can, we can well, get into that. Listen, this, this is um, anyone listening has probably come to this show because it's a, a marketing podcast. Marketers talking about marketing, and that, that's why Kyle's here. But when we were doing the research for this, Kyle um, happened to mention that he's a fan of military history, which um, is one of my great pub bores. I love talking to people about history. So we're just going to segue for a few minutes just because I want to, to talk about history. So um, you're, you're two, two uh, preferred sort of periods in history the the u.s civil war and and world war ii uh two seismic events really in the in the history of the u.s that have, that have shaped the country you know the, the civil war sort of shaped it and then the second world war changed it and, and reshaped it again um do you see and, and i'm not asking your opinions on it but do you see some of the events of, of recent times being another seismic event that can change how the, the states is going to be for the next 50 to 100 years yeah. Yes. I mean, I don't, I don't think any um, community of people or institution can go through what we're going through right now and not change. And I think you're seeing that with, with little, like, at, you know, at the time of this recording, we're, we're experiencing all this Robin Hood, GameStop, like uh, investor communities mm -hmm. fighting each other, which is reminiscent of like JP Morgan in the 1920s before, you know, Black Tuesday or Thursday or whatever they called it. Um, I, yeah, I think, I think this nation is changing and I think it will. Um, I don't, I'm not sure I would put it on the same le seismic level as a world war or a, or a rebellion, a true rebellion. Um, but it's definitely changing. And I, and I mm -hmm. think that um, it's going to be very important for us to continue trying to meet in the middle as a country. Um, and, you know, I think that we will, I think in the end it will, it will, it will happen. I think so. In the UK, we have a the, in, in in schools. There's a fairly predictable syllabus of, of education things, and look, we, we've got a very long history as a country. You know, you start learning about the Romans. Uh, we don't really do the Greeks, but you start learning about the Romans. Come up to modern day, and there's so much that you don't get taught about British history because there's so much of it. Uh, but one thing that rarely makes it onto the syllabus is the American Civil War. The, I think there's a look at it because it was, the, is it the beginning of the end of the empire and stuff like that? But it was, a, I don't think many Brits, unless they've taken time to go and look at the Civil War, really understand just the scale of it and the the fault lines of it, that, that kind of came because of it. And I have spent a little bit of time reading about it and watching a few programs and just being blown away by the numbers of people who were involved and the number of deaths on site. And you're like, given when it took place, that must be a phenomenal amount of people percentage wise who've been affected by it. Yeah. I don't, I don't remember the actual percentage. What's fascinating about the, the beginning of the civil war is, and this is going to get really nerdy. So sorry, is the, is the tactics that they employed were so far behind the, the technology. So the smooth bore musket got really, really, really accurate and they still walked people right in front of them. And it was the carnage was um, was, I mean, nobody had ever seen that type of carnage, and they didn't until World War One, right? Where mm -hmm. 
you know, that's just a completely different level of madness yeah. um, in World it, War II. It's but, amazing how generals who aren't on the front line seem to take quite a long time to learn the lessons over and over yeah. again, isn't it? I've well, you think what's, fodder, fasc yeah. what's fascinating about Civil War, think about, you're talking hundreds of thousands of people, like 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 mile long train cars, not, tra well, sometimes trains, sometimes wagons of supplies. And there were no, like, it was just people writing notes to each other, riding horses back and trying to figure out where the hell everybody was. That was half of it that nobody knew, nobody knew where anybody was. And you're, you're talking like battles and, and tens of thousands of people would die because they randomly ran into each other in Tennessee. Right. And that, mm -hmm. that didn't happen that often, but it, I think that it's, I think if you get really deep and trying to understand that's why Stonewall Jackson was such a great general is that he pushed his troops so hard that they could move so fast. That's how he won most of the time. And then he got shot by one of his own people and died. Like, it's just, I, I have a, it was a terrible war. It needed to happen. We, we were, we emerged as a stronger nation, in my opinion, through U.S. Grant as a president after it. Mm -hmm. And um, I have, the, I, there's some romantic, I romanticize it a lot because there's just so much that happened in that 10, 10 years, give or take, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, and you, you're talking about a nation that brothers were actually shooting at each other. I mean, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. That is crazy. So, you know, and, and it's part of, it's part of our history and, and we, we actually don't do a great job educating either on it here in America. So and we could it, use it, more of it. It's woven into the fabric of the, of the country, isn't it? And yeah. it's, um, and it's just one of those things that, that the mythology is, is, is more powerful than the facts of the situation as well. You know, you start to read about some of the characters in there and, and some of the people and some of the battles and go, oh, that's not what I thought that battle would be. <laughs> so it's interesting how it goes. I, I'm going to try and take a, an awkward segue back into marketing, if you can stick with me on this. But I think okay. you mentioned there <laughs> about the, the, the issues with the, the civil war and how those lessons took a long time to learn. And First World War, the generals did the same thing. One of the reasons I like history is that very little that I see in the world is new, right? right? Everything that we see, if you look back in history, you see the same stuff over and over again. Yeah, um, right. and, and content marketing is one of those. I did a webinar just the other day where we were talking about this, where people think content marketing was invented in about 2003 or 2004. <laughs> if you look back far enough, you're like, no, no, John Deere were doing uh, the Furrow magazine in 1880, something or other. I mean, Ben Franklin was doing content marketing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could look at uh, Wedgwood Pottery in, in England. Yeah. They they used to give their expensive pottery to, uh, it was basically influencer marketing. They would give it to Sir So-and-so and Lord and Lady Thingamajig um, so that it would be, oh, right, they've got this. Where did you get? Oh, it's Wedgwood Pottery. It was influencer marketing. It's just they were doing it without Instagram, right? So you look back at history and you start to see these trends. And, I, you know, are you looking back at anything now and going, this is what we're going to use next? That's, this worked in the 80s and we should bring it back now. I mean, we, we do a lot of direct mail. We were doing a lot of direct mail when I joined. In I love direct mail. I started yeah, I doing do. direct mail. Yeah. I love it. So, you know, I'd say that, but what marketers love to do is name things that, that are just <laughs> recreate, like account-based marketing. Like, give me a break. It's, it's, it's what, it's what, re it's what you should be doing. Like named account lists, personalized outreach, deliver the thing that they want to get them to take a meeting or whatever. I'm, I'm yeah. completely butchering it, but content marketing is the same thing. And, and you're right. I mean, it, marketing as a function is just trying to figure out what gets people in the door. Like I'm, I'm in the middle of Ron uh, Chernow's book, um, the house of Morgan, which is about JP Morgan. And it's huge. Uh, like I'm listening to it. it's 38 hours long. Like it's just what? a beast. And what they did, and they did it in London as well. They didn't do any marketing. They, there was no sign on any of their doors. You had to be introduced in order to bank there. And that is marketing just as much as what Chase was doing or, or National City was doing at the time selling bonds, right? So yeah. I just, I'm fascinated with this idea of how do you, how do you uh, build a story and experience around 
um, around what you sell and make it different. And I think that that's, mm -hmm. I think we've been doing that for centuries. The Romans were doing it. Yeah, I, 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 there is nothing new, is there? We just need to find a way to, to make it relevant or to accept that sometimes the delivery channels change, but the idea is still the same. Make it um, fun. Just make it fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm presenting um, probably about the time this episode comes out in, in early March anyway, at a conference, SMX Munich. Uh, I, I'm annoyed I'm not going to be there. I'll be presenting from a bedroom upstairs. I love Munich. Um, it's, a great, oh, it's a great, great city. city, great city. But so the, the presentation is called Which Means That. And it's about trying to get away from features to get to advantages and benefits mm. in, in content. Mm. Now, this isn't new, right? This is sales training 101 from the right. 1970s. Right. So don't just tell them something, but which means that. And I talk to marketers about it and they look at me like I've just invented fire. They're like, whoa, this is blowing my mind, Andy. And you're like, this, this is from like the, you know, the telesales 101 right. phone book. Right. Right. And you're like, oh, okay. Yeah. But, I mean, just, business impact, you gotta, you gotta be able, I mean, lessonly we're just now getting to the point where we have, you know, the customer involvement for us to show business impact and business outcomes and start using it in marketing. Mm -hmm. I wish we would, we would have done it sooner, but yeah, I mean, you've got to show the outcome. And that's, and, and you can, you can have a, you could send a ton of board games and they're really cool. And you have a bunch of golden llamas, but if you don't have business impact, you're not going to grow. Exactly. That's the reality. Exactly. Well, l listen, Kyle, we're, we're coming towards the end of the interview. We've, we've covered uh, history. We, we could do maybe a part two, just talking about history and yeah, second world that. war from the British and the American viewpoint. Cause yeah. you know, we see different things and we started at different times. But um, rather than lose all the listeners about now, <laughs> what I want to do is that there's a couple of questions I finish by asking every guest. The first is about what books are you reading? Now, you've already mentioned uh, Alchemy and The House of Morgan. Are there any other books that you would recommend for marketers to, to pick up and read or even podcasts or newsletters or, you know? Yeah, whatever? yeah, yeah. I, um... You'll, um, you'll be able to find links to all of the books that, um, that we've talked about and all the things in, in the show notes. So uh, you find them, click on them, and you can go off and buy them. So I, I'm, I'm a terrible reader of marketing material. I actually don't mm -hmm. do a lot of it. Most of it's history. But um, this, was, this, was, um, this book was referred to me by Manny Medina, who's the CEO of Outreach. It's called Rhythm by Patrick Fian. Yeah, um, it's more about execution through scale. And then mm -hmm. I have not started this, but I bought it to read it next after House of Morgan. Lessons from the Hanoi Hilton. Oh, it's basically leadership lessons from POWs. Um, I think it was it, it's out of Vietnam. Um, yep. Who's it by? Is that by um, and, uh, Admiral uh, Stockdale? We, it's a it's uh, with him, but it's about him. With yeah. Because he was part of it, I think. Yes, so that's yeah. what I would recommend. But I like because I just get so much more value of reading about the past, um, mm -hmm. both because I love it and you can gain a lot by learning how Benjamin Franklin did stuff or Thomas Jefferson or JP Morgan and all this, you know, Rockefeller. And so, yeah. uh, but those are, those are the ones on my bookshelf now. Definitely. No, great. The, the Stockdale paradox has been keeping me going through lockdown. Um, you know, basically, go and have a look. Google the Stockdale paradox and you'll find yes. it. But it's effectively don't uh, don't lose hope, but don't expect that it'll all be over tomorrow. Yes. Because um, the, the POWs who were thinking they'll be out by Easter when it got to Easter, they weren't out, lost hope and died. And those who thought we're never getting out of here, lost hope and died. So you had to expect it'll finish at some point, but not know when it'd finish, yep. which is yep. a perfect lesson for living through a pandemic, isn't it, at the moment? So. Yes, it is, for sure. Definitely. Well, look, the last question before we go, are there any questions that you're usually asked that I haven't asked you now? Why I hate onions. Ooh, ooh. Controversial. Why I, do you I, hate well, onions? I put, that, I put that on most of my bios on social. Usually somebody's <laughs> asking me why I hate onions. Because they're terrible. That's my answer. I, I, I will understand a raw onion. Raw, raw yeah. onion. Sorry, let me be yeah. clear. I will, I will, I, I, I will not eat raw onion. Period. Mm -hmm. And it's very rare that I want onions cooked or not on anything. So I don't know. I mean, yeah, I think you're missing out on a slow cooked, uh, sweated onion where it gets nice and sweet. No, anyway, but, uh, can't do it. I, I'm going to be off on a rant about onions then. We don't. <laughs> nobody needs that. 
listen, Kyle, thank you very much for your time today. It's been really wonderful. I hope you've got loads from this if, you, if you're listening. Um, we might have Kyle back for part two of the history sessions, um, but we'll, we'll talk about that another time. Kyle, thank you for your time. Uh, thank, thank you for having me.